My name is Charlie Black, Aerospace Structures Engineer here at Collier Aerospace. And in this video, I'm gonna be introducing you to our brand new software called HyperX. I'm also then gonna walk you through a brief tutorial that will hopefully teach you the basic mechanics of working with the software, such that you'll be able to kind of take that knowledge and use it on your own projects. So first and foremost, what is HyperX? HyperX is a software tool that couples with your finite element analysis in order to size, optimize, and write margins of safety to the structure that you are trying to design. It can be used at any stage of the design cycle. So anything from your preliminary design trades, you know, what material system should I use here versus here? Do I need hat stiffeners versus Z stiffeners? Things like that. But it can also be used at the end of the design cycle, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, maybe when you're trying to write final margins, publish stress reports, things like that. We also find that the software is a very powerful tool for collaboration. So think about a group of engineers that are trying to design or size the same vehicle. Using a HyperX database, all of those engineers can stay on the same page by keeping their material definitions, fastener definitions, analysis assumptions, manufacturing criteria, all of that kind of in one spot so that everybody starts on the same page no matter what. We also find it aids in collaboration between your analysis side of the house, so your finite element models, your stress guys, and your design side of the house, so your CAD world, your producibility guys. Okay, with all of that being said, I'm gonna quickly introduce the problem at hand and then we'll get started on this tutorial. So say you are the engineer in charge of design sizing the wing that I'm showing here, all the way up through PDR. What you're looking at is a simple wing box model that's meant to kind of represent something that you might see in the urban air mobility industry. The FEM up to this point is pretty coarse, only 35,000 elements but we have applied a total of 10 external load cases. And we've also picked a safety factor and an analysis temperature that we'd like to work with. We can take all of this information and using HyperX, we're gonna optimize the wing skins, spars, and ribs to all of those external loads applied in the FEM. We're also going to enforce various different manufacturing constraints to understand the, the effect that they have on the design results. Every step of the way, we're gonna be able to visually interrogate and verify all the results that we're getting. And at the very end, we're gonna print a stress report, which is meant to simulate something that you might need maybe for a design review. Just a quick overview of how this workflow is gonna progress. We're gonna create a brand new HyperX database, a brand new project, and we're gonna bring in that UAM wing fem from scratch. Then we're gonna do some sizing trades. So we're gonna start with metallic and size the upper skin to kind of understand how to set up and run your very first sizing. And then we'll switch over to composite and get some mass comparisons. From there, we'll zero back in on the upper skin and work on those manufacturability constraints and kind of work towards making our wing more manufacturable with each step. At the end of that, we'll have a set of global plies that we'll be able to actually visualize on our wing using the HyperX viewport. From there, we'll kind of switch gears a little bit and we'll create two different edge joints, one bonded and one bolted, and we'll go ahead and size those for positive margin to show off the expansive capability that HyperX applies to joints. At the very end, when we're happy with our design, we will export a word-based stress report and go over all of the different features that are available to print there. With all of that being said, let's go ahead and open up the software. And when you first run HyperX, you're prompted to make what is called a database. And a database is just the main file that you'll be working with when you're working in HyperX. So it holds things like your materials, your model, all of that kind of stuff in a series of data tables that the software operates on. In order to do that, you have to start with what is called a database template. 
which are these three guys up here. Basically what those are is a set of predefined materials, analysis assumptions, all kind of pre-populated in a database to provide a starting point. Usually we recommend that companies make these with their own materials and their own margin policies. But to mirror that paradigm, we ship a couple with the software installed. So we'll go ahead and use one of those. We'll say the aerospace template. And now I'm prompted to save my database. So I'm going to go to C hyper X database and we'll say UAM wing demo 01. And now we're prompted to make a project and a project is always correlated to one finite element model. And it's just the means by which the database and the model communicate with one another. So we'll say add and we'll say wing sizing. Okay. And now we're automatically prompted to import our finite element model. To do that, we go ahead and click add and we'll navigate to C hyper X models wing uam and we'll pick this first one the bdf file and we'll say open so it's important to note here that while we're using an msc nashran model we're actually pretty sovereign agnostic so the other different brands of nashran as well as abacus ansys and optostruct are all supported before we leave this forum the last thing we need to do is select our units so we'll go down here and hit select and this FEM was actually run in SI units, but I'm a little more comfortable working in English units. So we're going to keep this custom option and we're going to set our length to millimeters, our mass to megagrams, force to newtons, temperature to degrees Celsius to be consistent with our FEM. And then we'll leave the display units or the units that HyperX is actually going to show me while I'm working in English units. Okay, so we're going to go ahead now and hit import. And you can see my wing model populated in the background there. Before we leave this form for good, we're going to toggle over to the FEA results tab. You can see because I had my OP2 or my results file located in the same folder as my BDF file, the software automatically detected that it existed. And with those two files, HyperX was able to identify the 10 external load cases that we've applied. And as a user, I can select which data comes in from each of those load cases. By default, it's always gonna bring in our shell and beam forces, but we can also ask for things like displacements, temperatures, and pressures, you know, as are applicable. The last thing we wanna do to promote that interaction between our FEM subcases and what we're actually sizing with is toggle to our design loads table. This design loads list is the list of load cases that HyperX is going to be sizing to. Every single margin will be written to every single load case for every single zone that we are sizing. You can see by default that there is one design load case for every FEM subcase that we had in our model. And a design load case is defined by temperatures, both initial and analysis, as well as limited and ultimate factors. And we can use multipliers to create combinations of different cases. We can edit all of these things by saying right click edit so say for example we know that we wanted a 1.5 ultimate factor and we wanted an analysis temperature of 120. we can edit that for each case here on this form but in order to save us time and not have to do that for all 10 we can also go ahead and click this blue button at the top here to edit in excel now we can do the exact same change that we just made, but carry it down to the rest of our load cases. So we'll copy, paste, and the same for over here, copy, paste. So now all of our design cases have an analysis temperature there in column G of 120 and an ultimate safety factor there in column I of 1.5. We can then save this sheet, close it, and then we can use this orange button to directly re-import and, as you saw, 
edit those values in the table. Now that we've set all of our prescribed factors and analysis temperatures, we can go ahead and hit apply, close, close. And now we're ready to start interacting with our model directly. The best way to interact with your model when you first bring it in is through what we call the FEM tree. So if it's not already open for you, go ahead and open and pin it. And you can see the FEM tree just organizes all of the different FEM data that HyperX found in your bulk data file. So you can see things such as grid point counts, 2D element counts, and you can also see that each property is shown organized by type. And you can also see the various different materials that came in from the FEM. This green check mark here indicates that this MAT1 70001 came directly from your FEM and matched something that was in your database. So you already had something that matched those material properties defined, and it therefore exists as a database entity, not just on your FEM tree. As you hover your cursor over these different properties, that the software will show you an echo of the corresponding property card from your FEM. Again, another set of visualization and verification. At this point, it's time to tell the software what we want to be working with. And in order to do that, we have to create entities that are called structures. So on this slide is the map of the different entities you have kind of at your disposal. So we are living here on the left in the FEM world. We have our FEM elements that have been defined and we also have the element to property assignments that have also been defined directly from your BDF. In order to tell the software that you want to work with these properties, you have to put them in what is called a structure. And a structure is a group of properties or a group of entities that are somehow related to one another. Maybe they are gonna contain the same design or manufacturing criteria. Maybe they're manufactured on the same tool face. And when you do that, those finite element properties become a HyperX entity called zones. One zone corresponds to a FEM property and all of your sizing, optimization, margin writing, all of that is going to be done per zone. Zones are organized into structures, but we also have another organizational entity called sets. Sets are a little more arbitrary. They're user's choice to be used to display or assign certain common settings. With that basic understanding, let's go back to our model and let's start creating some structures. To create my structures, I'm gonna to go to the structures tab of the ribbon and I'm gonna click the farthest left button, create structure. And in this window that pops up, I can name my structure. So we'll say, we'll start with the upper skin. And now it's prompting me to select the FEM properties that I want to put in this structure called upper skin. So we'll go ahead and select the upper skin and we'll say create. And now you can see I have an upper skin structure in my structures tree. And now that same property on my FEM tree has a green check mark. In order to keep track of all the properties that I'm putting into structures, I'm gonna go ahead and hide the structures that I'm creating. This way I have access to the rest of my model. The next structure I'm gonna make is the ribs. So there's a couple other different ways to make structures. First of all, if I want to maybe use the search feature, I could say rib and all of the properties containing ribs in the title will be filtered. And I can use control to select all of these guys and then directly on the FEM tree, right click and say, create structure. We'll say ribs, create. Now directly in the FEM viewer, I can click on all of my spar parts, hold shift to select multiple properties. And from right there, I can go ahead and say, right click, create structure, spars. And last but not least, we'll go ahead and create our lower skin from that remaining window. So now we've essentially exited our FEM world and entered the HyperX world. We can go ahead and show all of our structures. 
you can see they're all organized in the structures tree by the various different property types that are included in that structure. The next step is to take these entities and assign various different properties to them that give HyperX the bounds and the qualifications for sizing. To better illustrate this point, we're gonna only focus on the upper skin for right now. So I'm gonna right click and say show only. And the first thing I want to do is I want to define the design space of my upper skin. To do that, I'm gonna create what is called a design property. So we'll go over to the design section of the ribbon. And let's start with a simple metallic plate, something like what came in from the FEM. So all the way to the left here, we'll say plate. And we'll go ahead and name this guy's simple metal sizing. Now we select a mode. So we wanna size by zone rather than by element. And now we have to pick a sizing mode. So we could either do rapid sizing, detail sizing, or final analysis. A brief definition of each one, rapid sizing is the simplest for users, but it's also the most rudimentary in terms of the sizing process. So right now, when we're in this conceptual force mesh femme design phase, rapid sizing is actually pretty good because as the user, all I have to do is define a material. I don't have to define any sort of thickness bounds or anything like that. And HyperX uses any sort of manufacturing constraints and failure criteria to find the lightest weight design that returns positive margin. Detailed sizing is a little bit different in that it relies totally on the user to define the entire design space. So in this case, I would have to define a material as well as a minimum bound, a maximum bound, and a step size. Final analysis is the other end of the spectrum where I would have to give this plate an exact thickness and a single material. At that point, the software is only just writing margins. We're in this conceptual design phase, so we're gonna use rapid sizing. So right click, select metallic, and we'll pick this simple metal that came in from the FEM. So we click apply, close. And now you see on your property tree, under designs panel, you have a plate design that corresponds to that simple metal you just made. At this point, this property isn't assigned to anything yet. It has to be assigned or inherited by elements in order to mean anything. In order to do that, we can actually click and drag this property directly onto our upper skin. And now our upper skin zone has inherited this simple metal design property. And you can see in my structures tree, that's clear because now my structures tree knows that this upper skin is a metallic plate rather than just a 2D unassigned property like it was a second ago. The next thing we need to do is define how HyperX processes the element by element loads within these zone boundaries. So what we're defining is our FEA load extraction technique. Essentially, what metrics do we use to take the element by element forces and extract them and compute a zone set of design two loads? The most basic of these FEA load extraction techniques is element based, which means you're actually gonna size to every single component of every single load for every single load case within your elements. This is obviously the most comprehensive because even your outliers are considered, but it's also gonna be the slowest analysis time. On the flip side, you could use instead what is called peak element, which uses a set of metrics to identify the highest loads or the worst case load conditions out of all of your element forces that are available. This method is the quickest because in any given zone, you're only ever gonna look at 32 different worst case scenarios, regardless of how many load cases that you have. We also have a little more of a clear statistical approach called N sigma, where you use your standard deviation distribution to capture the general load trend, as well as account for a certain amount of outliers, you know, user's choice. A special case of N sigma is average or zero sigma. 
where you literally take the area weighted average of each component of load for each element and size to those. The advantage of peak element over these statistical approaches is that these statistical approaches will still run every single load case. For example, if you had a large model with thousands of load cases, you would still evaluate every single zone for every single load case. Whereas with peak element, no matter the number of load cases that you have, you're only going to ever run 32 of the worst cases for each zone. In order to define that load extraction technique, we have to define what's called a load property. To do that, we go to model, loads processing, load extraction method, and let's do peak load. And you can see in our peak load property form, we name our property, and then we can select which components of element load we want included in this metric. In this case, we do want all of them. So we'll go ahead and hit apply and close. And now this load property lives on the property tree under loads FEA. And just like with our design property, we can click and drag that guy on to our structure. The last thing we need to do is define an analysis property or to tell the software what failure criteria we want to be sizing this upper skin to. So let's go to the analysis tab. All the way on the left, we'll say create analysis property, panel, and we'll call this metal sizing. And now we create what are called failure modes. And several failure modes live in your analysis property. And each failure mode is essentially a category of individual failure criterion. So let's create a new failure mode. For our upper skin, we want to run panel buckling since we're using 2D elements. And we also want to run metallic strength. So let's make metallic strength first. And this list comprises every single metallic strength failure criterion that HyperX has to offer for sizing. Let's say it's my company's margin policy to size for von Mises at yield. And let's say it's it should be max principal at ultimate. We'll save this as metal strain general. Apply, close. And now my new failure mode lives in my analysis property. Let's make one more to define our panel buckling criteria. So in this case, we want to run analytical panel buckling in the biaxial direction, in the shear direction, and an interaction of the two. So we'll go ahead and save this as panel buckling general. Say apply, close. And at this point, that's all we really care about running for our upper skin. So let's say apply, close. And now that analysis property lives under the analyses section of my property tree. And just like the other two can be clicked and dragged directly to the upper skin structure. Now that we have defined what we're sizing, the design space of what we're sizing, how the loads within what we're sizing are going to be extracted and the failure criteria that are going to be evaluated, we're actually able to go ahead and run our rapid sizing. We can do this by going to the run tab and hitting this play button, or we can go up here to our custom ribbon and hit the play button. Just as a note, this customized ribbon, any button from the normal ribbon can be clicked and dragged over here for easy access. We already pre-populated with some of our most used buttons. I'm going to select my upper skin. I'm gonna hit run. And now I'm ready to start viewing my results. We could go over to the results tab and open up the legend, which also exists on my custom ribbon. And the first thing that we're looking at is a plot of the minimum margin of safety in this zone. And per the definition of rapid sizing, this zone was sized to find the lightest weight design 
that attains positive margins. So it's not surprising that this margin is just above zero. We can also view things such as controlling design load case, which is three, our guest case, as well as controlling criterion, which unsurprisingly is panel buckling. We're also able to view our sizing results, so we can select sizing results. And now what we're showing is our top face thickness, which right now is 0.272. To further understand the weight of our structures, we can also show the actual value in pounds in our structures tree. From this little square at the top, the tree options, we can go down to weights. And now you can see my upper skin at this 0.272 thickness has a weight of 481 pounds. That seems a little heavy to me. So I wanna use some of our tools to kind of understand what's going on there. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to right click on my structure and look at my analysis results. Now this window is populated with every single margin of safety written for my selected zone, which is my upper skin. So you can see that my driving criterion, which is panel buckling, has a very low but positive margin. And it is a lot lower than the next strength criteria. That tells me that my design might not be very well optimized. Let's kind of think about what we can do about that. Maybe in order to do that, I wanna have a better understanding of the method. To access the HyperX help system and go directly to the method in question, I can actually right click and say criterion documentation. And now I'm brought directly to the panel buckling page of my help system. So I'll scroll down to this HME, which stands for HyperX Methods and Equations. And this document outlines every single step to writing that panel buckling margin directly from that original differential equation. So we'll scroll all the way down here. And there is my critical shear buckling equation. What is perhaps more interesting to us though, is this biaxial buckling allowable equation. We can see that this allowable is driven by things like our D stiffness terms, our NX and NY loads respectively, our M and N half mode shapes, but we're also driven by these A and B terms, which if we scrolled up to our glossary, we would see that A and B represent our buckling lengths respectively, or the dimensions of our panel. So if we go back to the software, we can actually plot these. So I'll close my analysis window and my legend, and we'll go to the view tab, and we'll go to show buckling spans. And now you can see by the red there, the buckling span that HyperX calculated based on the element sizes as this zone was put into a structure. You can see that we have some issues here. First of all, the curvature is incorrect on our X span. So to correct that, we can right click and go to panel settings, buckling, change that to external Y curvature, apply. Now we've corrected the curvature, but even looking at these values for X span and Y span, you can see that they're still pretty big. And any engineer is gonna know that the longer or the larger your panel is, the more buckling critical it's going to be. What can we do to kind of rectify that? In this case, Let's go ahead and turn the rest of our structures back on so that I can visually make my point here. So you can see, even when I turn those structures on, that this one upper skin panel, which has been previously sized as one zone, is actually gonna be broken up by all of the ribs and spars within that. It's actually They're actually gonna serve as what we might call panel breakers. So this panel isn't acting completely on its own. It's actually a series of these individual square and rectangular bays in between each of those panel breakers. Each of these rectangles should be its own zone 
zone or maybe should have been its own property in the FEM coming in. I could go back to my preprocessor and fix that on the FEM side, or I can use the HyperX zone splitter utility to do that quickly in my HyperX database. So we'll go to structure and we'll select all of our zones and we'll go to split up zones and we'll select to split on orthogonal members and on beam intersections. We'll go to apply. And now you can see by the color indications that each of those bays is now its own zone. To further illustrate this point, we can turn our buckling spans back on. I'll go ahead and hide my upper skin. And we can see that those buckling spans are now more descriptive of the zones that we have created rather than spanning the entire panel. So let's rerun our upper skin and compare the results to what we were seeing before. Remember our weight before was right around 480 pounds. So we'll go ahead and select our upper skin. We'll size. We'll open up our legend. And now you can see as an implication of all of those panels being broken up into their own zone, each zone can have its own thickness. So now the thickness is able to vary along the wing. And you can see just by doing that, we were able to save 200 pounds, give or take. We can go back to our analysis results. You can see that we're still analytical panel buckling critical, but we do still have all positive margins. Now that we understand what it takes to set up a problem and set up a sizing in HyperX for the case of a simple metal plate on one part. Let's let's take that one step further and let's use the same process that we just learned to go ahead and set up and run sizing on the rest of the structures that we created. And while we do that, let's go ahead and change gears and let's use a composite material system. This will allow us to compare to the metallic results that we just got for the upper skin, as well as help you to learn the various different composite workflows that we have at this early stage of the design cycle. Let's go ahead and close our legend and show the rest of our structures here. Use the tree to do that. And let's work on defining our 2D plates first. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide my 1D properties using their corresponding nodes in the tree. And let's go ahead and make a composite 2D plate design property. So let's go to design, create laminate, one stack. And this is going to be our solid laminate design space. So we'll select zone-based sizing. We'll stick with rapid sizing. And you'll notice this is actually very similar to what we were just doing with the metallic sizing in that all we have to do in this rapid sizing mode is select apply material. Let's go ahead and right click, select tape. Go ahead and use the call your thin ply. And the last thing I wanna note before leaving this form is rapid sizing is gonna work the exact same way here in that anything that inherits this design property is going to be sized all the way up until it reaches a thickness that attains all positive margins to the failure criteria that we define. But it's also gonna be doing that while also respecting the ply angle percent rules, layup rules, and fabrication rules that are defined on this form. All of these rules were defined by your database template, so they came in like defaults. And we're gonna play with those a little bit later, but in this case, let's just go ahead and leave them as the defaults for right now. So we'll go ahead and hit apply, and we will close. And now you'll see we have a laminate, solid laminate design property in our tree. And we can select all of our 2D plates in the viewport and drag and drop that property directly. And you can see now the upper skin has been switched to laminate and the ribs, spars, and lower skin all have laminates in them. Following the pattern here, the next thing we need to do is assign a load property. Let's go ahead and use the same peak load. We'll go ahead and assign it to all structures. The last thing we need to do is we need to create a new analysis property that better reflects our new design space. We'll go to analysis, create, panel, 
Let's call this one solid laminate as well. We want to check for a lot of the same things for our solid laminate as we would for our metallic plates that we were looking at earlier. We want to check to make sure that there is no plate buckling and we want to check our strength. We're still just using those 2D elements, so we can actually use the same buckling criteria that we defined earlier. So let's go ahead and say select existing and select your panel buckling general that you made earlier and hit OK. And now we just need to define a couple of new ones that are specifically for composite based strength. So let's go create new. We'll start with ply, hit next. These are all of the different ply-based failure criteria that HyperX has to offer. I think the defaults are okay, so let's go ahead and say apply, close. And the last thing we want to do is consider a situation in which you or your company has access to laminate level test data. You have new laminate level allowables that are supported for things like open hole compression or maybe shear after impact or anything like that. HyperX is actually able to incorporate that into your sizing natively. What you would do is define those values actually on your material. For example, if I go into my composites library and I pull up this call your thin ply tape that we're using, you can see that I actually have defined laminate level allowables at the various different temperatures. You see, I have CAI, OHC, and FHC all defined and ready to be used for sizing. In order to implement those allowables, we need to implement a laminate level failure criteria or failure mode. So let's go to create new, composite laminate. And let's say for this case, let's stick with the default open hole compression and open hole tension. We'll say apply, close. We'll go ahead and say apply and close this as well. And then we will select all of our 2D panels and we will drill down to the new solid laminate analysis property and drag and drop that directly on our structures. Those are all fully defined and ready to be sized. The last thing we need to do is define our beams. So let's go ahead and turn those back on. So we'll do that in the ribs and in the spars. I'm also gonna hide my upper skin so that we have a little more visibility on what we're selecting here. For our beams, we have several different designs that we can choose from. We can choose from an open design or a closed design, but I think in this case, it's best to consider all of our beams as cap beams. When we're sizing our beams, we're gonna size the thickness and the width. And sticking with the theme here, let's go with laminate. And now you'll notice that there actually isn't a rapid sizing option when you are sizing your beams with composites. This actually gives us an opportunity for me to show you another sort of conceptual level design option that you have when using composites in HyperX. To do that, let's go ahead and go to detailed sizing. And the first thing we have to do is select apply material. Right click, select tape. We'll go with that same call your thin ply tape. Now what we want to do is use HyperX to create what are called effective laminates for sizing. In order to do that, we have to define various different ply angle percentages that we want to have included in those effective laminates. So in my one laminate, I want to have X percent of zeros, X percent of 45s, and X percent of 90s. We're not defining the main stacking sequence right now, we're just defining those percentages. In order to have more control over the options of percentages, we have to loosen up our ply angle percent rules a little bit. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. Select ply angle, and just in the tape section, go 0, 100, 0, 100, 0, 100, just to give yourself complete control when using the effective laminates generator. Okay, and make sure to hit apply to save all of those changes. And now go ahead and right click on that material selection again and go down to generate effective laminates. So if you look at this diagram at the very top, this is exactly what I was talking about in terms of generating laminates in which you're selecting the number of plies and you're selecting the relative percentage of each different ply angle that comprises those plies, but you're not generating a 
fully defined discrete stacking sequence. If we think about it, most of our caps are most likely going to want to be unidirectional. They're going to want to be mostly zeros. Let's go ahead and steer into that. Let's go ahead and say for our zeros, we say a min of 70%, a max of 80%, and a step size of 10 to give us two options there. And then for 45s, we'll do 10, 20, with also a step size of 10 to give us another two options for 45s. And then we'll do 10, 20, 10 <laughs> for 90s as well. Go ahead and hit generate and HyperX will automatically generate the three effective laminates that fit our rules that we just defined. So if we go ahead and view those, we see that we have three effective laminate options and the percentages are defined in each one and they stay within the bounds that we just selected. Now we need to manually define our design space as per detailed sizing. Let's go ahead and switch from inches to plies because I think that's a little bit easier to visualize. And we'll say our, our min gauge somewhere around four plies. And we'll go, let's just go all the way up to a hundred where at the beginning of our, of our design cycle, we really have no idea at this point. And maybe we'll have a step size of two. And for our width, we don't want these things to get too wide. So let's just go from an inch to an inch and a half and only include two steps in between or a step size of 0.5. So let's go ahead and apply and close. And now we can go ahead and apply our design property to our beams. And I'm gonna show you another way to do that. So go ahead and expand the design beam section where your cat property lives. And also go ahead and select the 1D property nodes in your structures tree. You see when they do that, all of your beams become highlighted, just like if you were to select them in the viewport. And you can actually drag and drop from the property tree directly onto your structures tree to apply that property to those selections. So now you can see both the ribs and the spar structures now have beams defined instead of just being unassigned 1D properties. Keeping with the pattern, the next thing we have to do is give those beams a load property. Peak load works here as well. So let's go ahead and do the same thing and select beams in the structures tree and drag and drop that peak load property on those beams. And the last thing we need to do is define an analysis property for our beams. So let's go to analysis, create beam. And since we're using composites here, we can actually use the same composite strength methods that we put together in the last analysis property. So if we hit the select existing, we can go ahead and select our composite laminate and we can do the same for our composite fly. Now we just need to apply some sort of beam stability criteria in order to capture any sort of local buckling or crippling that might occur within those beams and those bays. Let's hit create new and we will add local buckling, say next. I think the defaults look good. So we'll apply, close, and we'll do the exact same thing for crippling. So now we hit apply, close, and now we have a beam category under analyses in the, in the property tree. And we can go ahead and drag and drop that analysis property into our structures tree. Now our entire wing has been fully defined and is ready for sizing. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn my upper skin back on. I'm gonna select the entire wing and I'm gonna hit run. Taking a little bit longer this time just because we are sizing every single zone here. All right. Now let's go ahead and start viewing some results. The first thing I'm noticing is everything seems to have positive margins. That's not surprising since our plates are using rapid sizing and our beams have such a wide thickness. We can also see that the upper skin weight went down. So we saved a bunch of weight there by switching to composite. And now we have weights for all the rest of our structures broken out by each type of zone in the structure. Note the project total weight at the top as well. 
Let's also view some of our other results. So we'll use the legend and let's look at our controlling criterion. Okay, so it looks like our panels are still controlled by analytical panel buckling. And then we have several instances in which our beams are controlled by strength and or crippling or local buckling, just depending on their location. So now let's look at some sizing results. So if we view the top face thickness, we see that each of our plates has its own thickness. And as we would kind of expect, the plates out towards the tip of the wing are a lot thinner than the plates towards the root that are taking most of the load from the fuselage. If we turn on the upper skin, yep, we see a lot of the same trends there as well. We can also view the cap thickness. So you can see a similar trend there where the beams that are closer to the root are thicker than those that are towards the tip. You see the same on the bottom face as well. We can also look at the cap widths. So in this case, the majority of the caps wanna be somewhere around an inch, whereas some of the ones that are connected directly to the fuselage need that little extra half an inch thickness. That's how we get a preliminary sizing result for the entire wing. Let's now go back to focusing on just the upper skin and we'll talk about how to turn the results that we have and use them as something that's a little more manufacturable. We're also gonna try and squeeze out some more of that weight since it is still coming in pretty heavy. I'm gonna go ahead and just show only my upper skin. Let's recall that we have a max thickness of somewhere around 0.28 and that sizing is being driven by analytical panel buckling in all zones. As an engineer in this case, if I'm trying to combat panel buckling in the most weight efficient way possible, what I wanna do is I wanna try and use a honeycomb sandwich and see if I can't get this design to close for a little bit lighter of a structure. So let's go ahead and try that. So let's open up our design tab again. We'll go to sandwich, honeycomb, and we'll select laminate, we'll stay composite here. And let's go back into rapid sizing. You'll notice in this case, it's very similar. All we have to do is select a material for each object. So the top face, the core, and the bottom face. And just like with your solid laminate sizing, rapid sizing is going to use your failure criteria, your loads, and your ply angle percent layup rules and fabrication rules to find the optimum honeycomb design. For our face sheets, let's go ahead and select thin ply tape again. And then for our honeycomb core, we have hundreds of different options for honeycomb core that you can select. But in this case, let's let's get a variation here. So these ECA are Nomex cores. Let's go down to the 1 8 inch Nomex core. We'll select the same for Kevlar. So this 1 8 inch ECK. And we'll select the same for Hexel, so this 3.1 PCF 1 8 inch. Make sure you're holding control when you select those options. All right, and once we've selected all three of those, we'll hit OK and we'll hit Apply and Close. And now we have a Sandwiches section under our Designs panel on our, our property tree. Let's go ahead and expand that. We'll select our upper, our upper skin and we'll drag and drop that sandwich property directly. Our upper skin already has that peak load property assigned, so we can skip that step. And we do need to go ahead and create a new analysis property since we don't have any failure criteria defined to capture the sandwich strength and stability modes that we wanna look at. Let's go to analysis, panel, and we'll call this one sandwich. And let's add the ones we know we can use. So we want panel buckling, laminate-based composite strength, and ply-based composite strength. You can hold shift to select all of them. And we'll say, okay. And now let's create a sandwich failure mode. So we'll say, create new. We'll go to sandwich. Okay. 
And you can see for the sandwich failure modes, we're checking things like face sheet wrinkling, dimpling, core crushing, flat wise tension, and core shear. All of the defaults look good. So let's go ahead and say apply and close. And now we have defined an analysis property that will account for our new sandwich design. So let's go ahead and apply, close. And now let's assign that analysis property to our structure. So after doing that, we are ready to run. I'm gonna close these to clean up our structures tree here. And let's let's keep an eye on this 167. Let's, let's see what kind of weight we can squeeze out by changing to the sandwich design. So let's go ahead and select and hit run. Okay. Shaved off over 120 pounds here just by switching to sandwich. Let's view some of those results. So we're no longer buckling controlled, but we do still have positive margin. What about our sizing results? So we can look at our core thickness, which is able to vary zone by zone. And we can also look at our ply counts on each face sheet. So we go to laminates, total ply count, and you can see, just like we were seeing before, we are still continuing that trend where we're kind of padding up the roots of the wing. We can also view the material selection. So in this case, we gave HyperX three different cores to choose from, and each zone was able to select its own core. So you can see there's actually a pretty wide disparity between the Nomex, the Kevlar, and the Hexel. I personally think that's a bit too difficult to manufacture, trying to splice in all of those different core types. And let's say in this case, Hexel is a little bit cheaper and I already have some in my shop. So let's go ahead and baseline this Hexel. So that's the first of our design decisions that we need to make at this stage in order to make our wing a little more manufacturable. So let's go ahead and go into our design property and we will right click select honeycomb and we'll go ahead and scroll all the way down and just select our hexl 3.1 pcf we'll say okay apply close we'll go ahead and rerun okay now all of our zones are 3.1 pcf hexl you can see we took a little bit of a weight hit for that because it wasn't the most lightweight core we could have chosen and I'm sure the face sheets had to adapt accordingly. Yeah, there's a little bit of change there as well. Maybe to combat that extra weight that we gained by applying only one core, we can try to make that up by relaxing some of our layup rules. So first, let me look at my minimum margin of safety here. So yeah, a lot of our zones are at min gauge, but showing pretty high margins of safety. That shows me we have a little bit of room to play with our layup rules and ply angle percentages and things like that. So let's go ahead and open up our design property again. First, let's say we wanna relax our ply angle rules. Let's go ahead and let the top and the bottom face be whatever they need to be. So we'll go zero to 100, zero to 100. And let's also change our min gauge ply to two since we're using tape. Zero, 100. We'll do the same for the bottom face here. Okay, let's click apply to save that. Now let's see what that does to our weight. We lowered our min gauge and we allowed HyperX to choose any percentage that works best in terms of our ply angles. So let's go ahead and hit run. All right, gained about six or seven pounds back just by relaxing those ply angle rules. More of our zones are positive, but have lower margins of safety, which supports our lighter weight. Let's try one more thing though. So let's open up our design property again. Let's change some of our layup rules. Let's see what happens if we stop enforcing symmetry on both face sheets. Click apply, close, 
Now we run again. All right, looks like we saved an extra four pounds just by relaxing our symmetry constraints there. And if you look, more of our zones are more well optimized in this case. Let's go ahead and view some of our sizing results just to make sure. So, yep, we're seeing total ply counts that are lower than we were seeing before, but still padding up towards the root, which makes sense. And let's view our core thickness. Little bit of disparity there, but we can go in and clean that up here in a bit. At this point, we've begun to understand how we can use HyperX to play with and understand the different manufacturing constraints that we're applying, especially in terms of composites. Now what we want to focus on is how do we take the result that we're happy with, so the design, the lightweight design that we have right now, and turn it into something that a machine shop or that your CAD guy will understand and be able to communicate. If we click on one of these designs, say maybe right click and, and go to the design result, you see that all we know right now is that we need four plies on the top, four plies on the bottom, and a 0.4 inch core. And we also know the relative percentages of each ply angle that we need, but we don't have that discreetly defined layup. In order to do that, in HyperX, we use what are called laminate families. I'm going to go ahead and close this. We'll close our results. And we're going to generate a laminate family based on the results that we've just gotten. For those who are not familiar, a laminate family is a collection of laminates that share the same main stacking sequence in such a way that each laminate is some sort of subset of that main stacking sequence. So if you look at our example here on the right, the very first column is what we call the main stacking sequence, and then each subsequent row represents a global ply, and each subsequent column represents a laminate, which will then become a candidate laminate for zones during sizing. The reason we like to use laminate families is because organizing laminates in this way kind of automatically makes your solution more manufacturable because all of your candidate laminates are related to one another. And the thing that makes HyperX so special is that HyperX is able to actually generate both the main stacking sequence and the candidate laminates automatically based on the optimum solutions that you are getting for each zone. So the green boxes that just appeared there indicate the solutions that already satisfy your zones. And the red boxes that I just highlighted are indicating the filler plies that have to be added to each of those laminate solutions in order to make it compatible with the rest of the laminates in the family. With all of that being said, let's go ahead and switch back to the software and generate one of these on our own from our own results. We will select all of our zones. We'll go to the composites tab, which houses all of our composites based tools. And all the way to the left here, we have create laminate families. We'll go to the top one, laminate family. So this is our general laminate family form. You can open this at any time and you can create your own laminate family. You see we have add row, add column, enforce symmetry, you know, tools like that to kind of help you define your own. But the other thing that we can do is we can select this enable automated tools button. And we are actually able to use these tools that just appeared in the top here to generate a laminate family based on the results that already exist. And you see, these are the zones that we have selected. This is the design property from those zones. And we are inheriting our ply angle percentages and our layup rules from that design property. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and hit this blue button here that says generate main stacking sequence. So now our main stacking sequence consists of 14 different ply angle options. Let's also name our laminate families. So we'll say lam fam 01. And we have the option to select a different stacking shape if we would like. So we can use triangle, up inverted triangle, diamond, hourglass, or interleaved. Most of our customers tend to use this hourglass 
because those ply drop sections are then protected by the outer full structure plies. So we're gonna keep it at hourglass and we'll go ahead and hit generate. And now you can see our table has been populated with our laminate options. So each column represents a laminate that will become an option for sizing and each row represents a global ply in the layup schedule. Another thing we can do here just to get a little bit more overview is we can turn on our metadata here, this purple line button. And you can see at the bottom of your laminate family form, we have the basic statistics describing our laminate family, which laminates are symmetric, which laminates are balanced, the total plies in each one, and then the percentage of each of those ply angles in each of our laminates kind of in line with those laminate columns. This is particularly useful when you have a larger laminate family and it's not as easy to visually verify. Okay, so let's go ahead and save our laminate family over here on the left. We'll close this form. And now we need to update our design property to show that we want to size with that laminate family. Let's go ahead and open our design property back up. We'll flip on over to detailed sizing. And instead of selecting apply material and manually defining these bounds, we're just gonna select our laminate family. There we go, hit okay. We'll do the same for the bottom face, right click, select laminate family, okay. And then for our core, we're just gonna go ahead and manually define our bounds. So based on some of the results that we were seeing before, let's go ahead and go from a 10th of an inch to six tenths of an inch, and we'll do a step size of 0.1, All right? So let's hit apply and close. And now let's go ahead and run our sizing. This will take a little bit longer because what HyperX is doing is trying each one of those laminates and seeing which one attains positive margin for each zone. Okay, so you can see our weight went up a little bit, which is not completely out of character when you're attaining this higher level of manufacturability. Let's first check our margins. Okay, so you can see we're all positive here. Okay, let's also take a look at our ply counts. So we'll go to sizing results, laminates, total ply count. Still seeing the same kind of trend where we're padding up towards the root of the wing. Now, since we're not in rapid sizing, we can actually have a different bottom face ply count. So let's go ahead and plot our bottom face ply count as well. And let's once again go back and look at our dimensions to see our core heights. To me, this is still looking a little bit difficult to manufacture just because it's gonna be tough to machine every single zone its own core height like we're seeing here. Why don't we try to taper our core heights down the wing? So let's select these first few zones here and let's right click and go to the dimension overrides table. Now in this table, you're only gonna see the zones that you selected and you're actually able to use it as the name might imply to override the definition on your design property. So in this case, we don't want to mess with the top or the bottom face, we just wanna mess with the core. And it works just like Excel. So we're actually able to do say equals max of all of our results column. Make sure to hit F4 to save those dollar signs in there, just like you would in Excel. And we'll hit enter. And then we will copy this cell to both the min and the max columns. So now you can see that maximum sizing result of 0.6 was applied to all of the zones that we have selected. And we'll hit apply and close. And let's do the same for this yellow section here. Right click, dimension overrides. Right, and equals max of results. Okay. 
copy, paste, and apply. And we will do the same here with the tip. Right click, dimension overrides, equals max results. And copy and paste. Okay. Now let's go ahead and rerun our sizing. And now we have a wing with a core height that tapers much more gradually in a much more manufacturable way. Again, we did take a little bit of a weight hit for that, but it's worth it for our manufacturability that we just gained. The last thing we wanna do, and to make this point, I'll go ahead and pull my ply counts back up again. So the last thing we wanna do is to combine these zone by zone laminate results into a global ply layup schedule for the top and bottom face that I can communicate to my CAD guy and also just kind of visualize for myself in the viewport. We actually have a nifty sequencing tool in order to do that. So I'm gonna close my legend. I'm gonna select my upper skin and still on this composites tab of the ribbon, I'm going to go to sequencing and let's start with the top face. All right, and in this form, as we were opening it, the software automatically generated a global ply layup sequence based on the results found in the zones that we have selected. On this table, what you're seeing is each row is a global ply and each column is a zone. So you can see how that global ply relates to your zone by zone results. And we also have various different metrics and, um, you know, ply counts, individual drops and adds. So you can kind of keep track of how manufacturable this design actually is. If you want to communicate this to somebody on your CAD design team, you can actually go ahead and export this to Excel. We support CATIA, FiberSim, and just a general HyperX export format. I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. And you'll notice when I did that, my upper skin structure now includes plies for my top face. To get the full picture here, let's go ahead and do the same for the bottom face. We'll go ahead and hit apply. Now you can see I have a core and bottom face plies in my structures tree. In order to view those plies, there are a few different things we have to do to set up the viewport appropriately. First, I'm gonna go ahead and orient my model a little better so it'll be easier to see. And then we're gonna turn on the ply display here at the top of the structures tree. You can see when we do that, that the plies have already been laid up or shown directly on your structure. Let's also go ahead and turn off our sandwiches. And let's go to the view tab and toggle off our mesh lines so that it's easier to see. Back on our composites tab, there are a few different view options that we can play with to get this display what we want, maybe for a screenshot or something like that. So the first thing I like to do is go to topological view. And then we're going to open the ply view options window. And we're going to go ahead and scale up our plies almost completely to the right end. We're also going to scale up our core as well so that we can see that too. Let's go ahead and hit apply. Okay. So now you can see from this kind of exaggerated view exactly what your design would look like as you were laying it up. So if I zoom in a bit, you see we're looking at the bottom face, the honeycomb core, and the top face ply layup schedule, where each kind of strip of color represents a ply of a certain degree. And you can see that my core actually tapers all the way down the wing, just like we designed it to. And you can also see things like, for example, my OML is actually my smooth surface, and my IML is where all of the ply drops are going to occur. Another thing that might be kind of neat to view is you can actually view the ply boundaries directly on the structure. So if we go to ply boundary view, 
and I will turn off my core there so it's a little easier to see. Now you can actually see on the outline of our structure where those ply drops and adds are gonna occur and what degree of ply is going to be added or subtracted, okay? So let's turn that off. The last thing I wanna show is the section cut capability. If I wanted to maybe see a cross-sectional view of my wing, I could actually use the section cut tool to draw a cut line, say maybe directly down the center, double click, and you see it took away half of my model so that now I can just see the cross-sectional view that I selected. And we'll go ahead and remove the cut to restore the original graphics. Before we wrap up this demo, there are a few additional tools and sizing capabilities that I want to go ahead and show you guys. So first of all, let me reorient here and we will turn on the rest of our structures. And I'm going to show you how to make a section cut and to tell the software to calculate all of the section properties of that cut. So first we'll use our view cube to kind of reorient ourselves, give us a straighter line to work with. On the structure tab, we go all the way to the rightmost button, which is section cut. And you're being prompted to name your section cut. And then the first thing you do is you draw a cut line. So you tell the software, where am I calculating my properties? So we'll go ahead and click that to enable that feature. And we will click to start the line and then drag that line down, double click to end it. And now you can see this window populated with the cut definition. So the global origin and corresponding vectors in each direction. When I hit apply, you can see that not only does a visual representation of my section cut show up, but all of my section properties have been calculated, including my EIs, my GJ, and my EA stiffness terms. If I wanted to size to a certain EI or GJ requirement, I can put a minimum stiffness bound in any of these boxes, and then I can turn that into a criteria that the corresponding zones would use for sizing. A couple of other things about section cuts, they're actually viewable from the structures tree. So if it's not already, go ahead and turn it on. And when you do that, you can now see this cut plane directly on your model. So to make that a little more clear, we'll go to view, translucent, and we'll turn off our mesh lines. So now you can see your section cut pretty clearly here. Just like with everything else on the structures tree, you can interact with it. So you can see it's highlighted there when I click it. You can right click and maybe show only. And you can reopen the section cut form to edit it. I'm going to go back and I'll hide my section cut and I'll turn my upper skin back on. We'll go ahead and turn translucent off, turn the mesh lines back on. And the next set of tools that I want to talk about is the joint sizing capability that HyperX has to offer. The first thing you'll notice about this model when we talk about joints is that this is a pretty coarse model, right? We're trying to represent the early on design process. So we don't have any contact elements or discreetly modeled fasteners or anything like that in order to facilitate our joint analysis. That's okay because HyperX actually has what is called an edge joint capability, which allows for the summation of the element loads to a particular edge in order to have a set of loads to approximate a joint sizing run to. In order to make an edge joint, we proceed like we would with any other HyperX entity. So we'll go to the structures tab and we'll say edge joint. The first thing we need to do is decide whether we want to make a one member or a two member edge joint. A one member represents a joint where all of the load has to go through that joint 
or the load will not be transferred between those two objects. Whereas a two-member joint represents a joint in which the load can also be transferred between the two members as well as that joint. In this case, let's make a one-member joint to represent the leading edge upper surface that will bond to the lower surface. So we'll stick with one member and we will select all of our edges. Hit create. Close. And now just like with the rest of our zone types, we have an edge joint node in our tree under the upper skin structure. And I'll go ahead and color by joint so that it's easier to see. And now again, just like with panels and beams, we have to define a design property, a load property, and an analysis property in order to analyze and size our joints that we just made. Let's start with a design property. So we'll go to the design tab. And in this joint box, let's make this a bonded joint. We want to bond our upper and lower skin together on the leading edge. To do that, I think the design that makes the most sense is a bonded step lap. So now you are brought to the joint design definition form for a bonded step lap. You can see that you're able to toggle between analysis and sizing modes. We're gonna stick with sizing for this example. And then we're given the opportunity to define all of the different variables of this problem that we want to size. You'll notice that a lot of our sizing variables are automatically defined as inherited, which means the software wants to take this information from the zone design corresponding to that edge. In this case, we actually don't really want to do that because in the real world, we're not going to bond two sandwiches together at that line. We would likely have some sort of edge band or solid laminate that we would have there to facilitate that bond. So in this case, we're going to switch from inherited all the way down to sizing selections. And we're going to select a few of our laminate family laminates. So if we scroll down, here's our hourglass laminate family. Let's do from 10 to 14, and then holding control, we'll also select eight and nine as well, okay? The point being, we don't know how thick that edge band needs to be, right? So the software is going to need all of these as candidates. The other cool thing about joint sizing is the user is actually able to define the order in which these candidates are tried. So in this case, Maybe we want to stick with the smallest to largest scheme. So I'm gonna move my eight ply laminate and my nine ply laminate up. And we'll say, okay. And we'll do the exact same thing for the adherent two material. Scroll down and select my 10 to 14, eight and nine. And shift our eight and nine up to the top. Now we need to select an adhesive. I believe there's only one in this database, so no need to switch to a sizing or anything. We'll just select one, say select adhesive, this epoxy. And now we need to define an adherent thickness. So this is a little weird because the software is actually gonna prioritize the thickness from our materials in our laminates but we need to go ahead and give it a value so that it doesn't get confused between what might be inherited and what it's trying to prioritize. So we'll just go ahead and give it a random value of one for both adherent one and adherent two. And we will also say that we have a adhesive thickness of 0.005. And we don't want to size that, we just know that we want to baseline that thickness. Now we want to decide how long our overlap should be. So let's go to sizing range, and maybe we'll go from half an inch to two inches by, we'll say, half an inch. And we also want to size the number of steps in our step lap joint. So we'll switch to a range again, and maybe for this one, we'll go from one to four, 
in increments of one step. The last thing we want to do is prescribe a free length for our joint. So let's in this case say two inches. So now we're ready to hit apply and close. And in order to assign that design property, it's much of the same. So we go to designs joint, bonded joint step lap. And notice that I've changed my selection to edge joint. And that means I can use my box to only select the edges and I can drag and drop that property directly on my joints. Now we need to define a load property for our joints. So in this case, it's okay to keep using our peak element that we've been using for everything else. So we'll go ahead and drag and drop that on there. And now we need to define a bonded joint analysis property. So we'll go to the analysis tab. We'll say create analysis property joint. And we'll name this analysis property bonded. And we'll create a failure mode for bonded strength. And in this case, we definitely don't need all of these default failure methods turned on. So I'll use this top checkbox to deselect all of them. And I want to run a stress-based analysis. So I'm going to select this joint bonded fracture, max stress. I'm going to select my tong interactions three and four, as well as my adhesive peel interaction. And the last thing I need to do is tell the software that my adhesive is nonlinear. So we'll check that box down here in the settings list on the bottom and we'll click apply close. And this looks good for my analysis property. So I'll say apply close. And now that analysis property is on my property tree under joint bonded. And I can click and drag it onto my joints. And now I can go ahead and size. Now to view our results, let's open up our legend. And we can actually turn off by zone and just see our margins of safety by joint. You can see we were able to size to all positive margins. We can still plot things like controlling load case and controlling criterion. You see we're pretty much dominated by our interaction cases there. And we can also view our sizing results. So flipping over to sizing results, we can check the adherent materials that were selected. So materials, and then now we have this bonded joint category. So we can see adherent one. You can see the majority of my joints require a 12 ply adherent, where some of these in the middle were actually okay with a nine ply adherent. And we'll see the exact same for our adherent two material. And we're able to go to our dimensions to see the number of steps selected. So you can see in some places we have two steps, in some places we have four. So we would want to pick one of those to baseline to enforce commonality across our joint because we're obviously not going to manufacture it that way. And we can look at our overlap length and see that we're actually sticking right at min gauge there for all of our joints. Before we move on, I want to toggle back to our adherent materials, go to adherent one. And I wanna point out the significance of what we were just able to size here. In our design property, we were able to size several different variables. And in this case, we're going to want to baseline the best results of those different variables and apply that to the rest of our edge because we want our joint to be uniform across the edge. I'm not gonna go through that workflow in this example, but I do wanna point out, particularly for the case of our adherent materials, we know that in this case, we want to baseline a 12 ply edge band, and we can use that information to inform our 
next level fidelity model that will have those edge bands modeled in. All of that being said, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So we'll close our legend and we will hide our one member edge joint. And we're going to focus now on fasten joints. And before we do that, we're going to upload a new laminate family. So early on in this demo, we created our own laminate family based on our sizing results. But what if maybe in this case, we have some test data or some laminates that have better bearing bypass data that we want to baseline as our edge band material in this case. What we can do is instead of using the laminate family that we already have, we can create one that corresponds to that laminate family that we have in house. So now we have our laminate family form open and I'm going to open up the spreadsheet that contains my laminate family data. So HyperX docs, laminate family for fasten joints. And I'm going to create this laminate family in my laminate family form. I can do that by copying and pasting these rows directly into the form, or I can manually create them. For example, I'll add maybe nine columns here, and then I can change my angles to 45. Add a row, change this one to minus 45. Copy that all the way over and so on, or I can import directly from Excel. So we'll say import HyperX docs. So now if we close this, say no, we can see my laminate family has been imported directly into my laminate family library. Okay, so now we need to go about defining which edge we want to represent our fa as a fastened joint. So recall that our upper skin is actually sitting on top of our ribs and our spars. And let's say we wanna model those contact points as fastened joints. So I'll turn those back off, but let's go to the structure tab. We'll say edge joint. And in this case, we actually wanna create a two member because the load is able to flow across the face sheet. We'll say this first edge just past the leading one. We'll say create. Okay, and I'll color by joint again. Now we need to define a design property for our edge joints. So we'll go to design. In our joint section, we'll go to fasten joint, single shear. And you can see that this form looks pretty similar to the bonded joint form. So the first thing we wanna do is toggle over to sizing. And again, we don't want to inherit our design in this case. We want to select from the laminate family that we just imported to figure out a baseline edge band thickness. So we'll switch from inherited to sizing selections. We'll select materials. And in the search bar, we'll search for joint. And let's bring in from 10 to 25. Say, okay. Okay. We'll do the same for our sheet two material. Search joint, 10 to 25. Okay. Now we want to pick a fastener selection. So we'll go to selections and we'll right click select fasteners. And you can see my database has already come pre-populated with hundreds of different aerospace industry standard fastener type definitions. And if I click on one of these guys, you can see that this form is actually made to represent a typical fastener spec sheet to make it easy to bring in your own data if you need to. We'll work with the high lock that I just had open. So we'll go from this number five all the way down to the 16 or the half an inch. We'll say, okay. Okay. And same as our bonded joint, we need to flip this sheet thickness and give it a value so that the software knows to prioritize the thicknesses coming from our materials instead of this value. So we'll set it to one, say, 
And in this case, we don't need to size to torque, but we do want to go ahead and size our spacing. So the distance between each fastener. So we'll give it a range of maybe half an inch to let's say four inches by half an inch. And we also want to give it the option to be either one or two rows. So we'll say a minimum of one, a maximum of two with an increment of one. And we'll click apply, close. And we can go ahead and select our joint and drag and drop that fastened property onto our edges. We can do the same with our peak load property. And now we need to make an analysis property consistent with our bolted joint. So we'll go to analysis, create joint. And in this case, we want to look at both sheet failure and fastener failure. So first we'll name our property fastened and then we will create our failure modes. So let's start with fastened sheet strength. And we want to look at both composite bearing and bearing bypass. So we'll say apply, close. And we will add another failure mode for fastener. And this one contains all of the different fastener failure, fastener tension, fastener shear, bending. In this case, the defaults are okay. So we'll hit apply close and we will commit these to our analysis property. So apply, close and drag and drop it onto our joint. And now we're ready to run. And we'll open up our legend and start viewing some results. So first we'll look at our analysis results. We'll check our minimum margins of safety by joint. And you can see, kind of makes sense, our lower margins of safety are towards the root of the wing where there is more load, and the higher one is toward the tip where there's less load. We can still look at things like controlling load case and controlling criterion. You can see we're controlled by composite bearing, which we would expect in this case. And then if we look at our sizing results, we can see first off our fastener selection we're actually able to baseline that number five all the way across the edge. We can also check our materials to see which of our laminate candidates were selected for our sheets. So the first couple of edges selected 25 plies, whereas towards the tip of the wing, we were able to taper off to 20 plies. These are the kinds of things, once again, that can inform your future model iterations, as well as any other design decisions that you might want to be making, you know, at this point in your sizing. Last but not least, we can check things like number of fastener rows. So again, we were able to size completely to one row. We can check our spacing. So you can see again, towards the root, kind of makes sense that the fasteners are wanting to be a little bit closer together, but they can taper off towards the tip of the wing. And again, these are the kinds of decisions that you would go back through and clean up to make more manufacturable. Okay, so at this point, let's say we are happy with our results and we want to go ahead and print out a stress report that summarizes everything we've done up to this point, maybe to support a preliminary design review. In order to do that, we can go to the results tab of our ribbon, select stress report, and let's do a word-based report. So this very top option. And what you're looking at now is every single option that is possible to print out from your database. So you can see project summary, zone data, margin of safety by each different criteria that you might wanna see as well as your controlling design loads, stress strain calculations, and so on. You're also able to give your document a title. So we'll say stress report example. You can put your company logo on here. And you're also able to fill in document number, your name, 
who's going to approve it, and so on, to make this report kind of come out of the box a little more well formatted, a little more professional. So we'll go ahead and hit export. So now we are looking at our Microsoft Word stress report that we just printed with all of our database information. So you can see right up front, we have all of the summary information. So our lowest margin of safety and the corresponding failure mode and controlling element. We can also check our table of contents to see all of the different things that were printed. I'm not gonna show you every single one of these. I'm not gonna scroll through 260 pages of data for you, but I will stop at the things that I think are more useful or that customers in the past have found a little more useful. If we go down to the zone dimensions section, you can see that for every single zone, the dimensions were explicitly written out. We can also check our margins for zone table, which tabulates every single margin of safety that was calculated for each object of each zone. So you can see this first zone, zone 14, was a sandwich object. And all of my margins that are written for the top face, the core, and the bottom face are all tabulated right here. The other cool thing I wanna make sure to point out is the sample calculations that this report will spit out. First, for the stress and strain analysis calculations, as well as for every single failure criteria that was run. So for example, if we go to the face sheet wrinkling, you see a brief summary of the method, as well as the loads corresponding to the most critical margin for that criteria, and then all of the other relevant intermediate data and the corresponding equations to use them in, in order to calculate that critical margin, which is given here at the bottom. At the end of each section of failure criteria, we actually provide you all of the references where those equations came from. And this is directly pasted from our help system. And at this point, we've reached the end of our Intro to HyperX demonstration. I hope you find this workflow to be useful on your own projects. Thank you for watching.